Hi, I'm Austin Andrus, and this is Ingenious Designs. These two books are every bit as different as they appear, but each is perfect at something. One was optimized for convenience, cost, and creativity, the other for longevity and tradition. Rebinding both these books challenged my assumptions about what the best materials and methods are, and changed what supplies I'm going to use in the future. And it all started with the book pages themselves. But to understand why, we need to take a trip back in time. In the mid-1800s, the primary ingredient in Western paper changed from cotton and linen rags to mechanically pulped wood. This change meant that the long structural cellulose fibers in the paper got chopped up more, making it weaker. It also resulted in more lignin in the paper. Lignin is a plant chemical that can break down over time into acidic components, causing the paper to become yellow and brittle within a few decades. After about a hundred years of this, people started to protest. And in 1989, around 40 major publishers committed to use acid-free paper for all first printings of quality hardcover trade books. Six years later, a sampling of first editions from these publishers found acid-free stock had been used in 93 to 99% of hardcover books and in 70 to 80% of paperbacks. Fascinating. But what does this have to do with my books? Everything. This volume is a paperback, it's not the first edition, and it's from a minor publishing house. These pages probably only have a 30 to 50 year lifespan to begin with, so it's hardly critical to obsess over using acid-free components in the new cover. On the other hand, this is a first edition printing from 1896. These pages have already survived over 120 years, and I want them to make it another 200. They just need a new cover. So I'm going to focus on using higher quality components with neutral pH so the new binding doesn't introduce any destructive acid. Does that make sense? Okay, let's bind some books. The main thing that will touch the pages is their end papers. These will be the only direct connection between the text block and the cover. So even though for this book, I'm not gonna stress about acid-free paper, I do want them to be durable enough to open and shut repeatedly. So I'm opting to use cardstock instead of ordinary paper. On the other hand, for my heirloom edition, I'm going with a more traditional luxury bookbinding material, silk moire. It's technically taffeta fabric with a pH neutral paper backing, but it can be found through bookbinding suppliers along with other papers. I'm using Hollanders because they're located in the US and have reasonable prices. Comparing the two materials, now that I've tried silk moire, I don't think I can go back. To me, it's sheer beauty outweighs the extra cost, so I think it will become my new go-to for future bookbinding projects. While I was on the Hollander's website, I also picked up some PVA glue to attach the endpapers with. There are a lot of glue options out there, but polyvinyl acrylate is popular among modern bookbinders because it's pH neutral, non-toxic, and dries clear and flexible. My adhesive of choice for the 30-year book is also PVA-based, Elmer's Tacky Craft Glue. It's acid-free, inexpensive, readily available at many craft stores, and has all the advantages of PVA glue that I already mentioned. Because it isn't pure PVA, and I don't know what else is in there, I can't be 100% certain that it'll hold up equally well years down the road. Still, after trying both products, I just find Elmer's glue easier to work with. It dries more slowly, giving me more working time, and it's more flexible when it dries. So going forward, I think I'm Team Elmer. The next few components used to prepare the text block won't affect its longevity, so I'm going to use the same products for both books. Any appropriately sized ribbon will work for the bookmark, provided that it looks the same on both sides. Some ribbons have a distinct front and back, which would look odd in the book. Similarly, the only difference between these two headbands is their color. I literally got them from the same eBay variety pack. I reinforced the text blocks with a little habotai silk. It's not the only fabric that could work, but I had some left over from another project, and just a yard or two of those scraps has lasted for over 60 books. If you want the same fabric, you can get it inexpensively on Etsy, but if not, then all you need is something thin and that doesn't stretch. The last thing that both books have in common is the foil I gild the page edges with. I use Foil Quill by We Are Memory Keepers, which is available on Amazon. I've looked into it, but in the end, I have no idea if foil quill is acid free or not. The We Are Memory Keepers company evolved out of a book bindery, so hopefully they've kept their roots in mind. But for now, this is just the only product I've found that works consistently. If you'd like to see a video where I test and compare other foil brands, let me know in the comments. If there's enough interest, I'll do it. 
As I start making the covers, the supplies for our two books diverge again, starting with the binder sports. For my cheaper books, I used some 100 point chipboard from Amazon. It comes in sets of 16 12 by 12 inch sheets, which is perfect for making both covers of this book because it has a 9 by 6 inch text block. But if I'm binding a larger volume, I can only make one cover per sheet with a lot of waste. Another disadvantage to these boards is that I don't really know which way the grain is oriented, and they're too stiff to find out by bending them. For the other book, I went back to Hollanders for Davy Board, a popular solution for high quality books. The boards are pH neutral, and they tell you online which way the grain is oriented. It does cost more per sheet than the Amazon option, but the sheets are significantly larger, which reduces waste on bigger projects and makes it equally economical in the long run. The only disadvantage I've found so far is that Davy Board isn't quite as tough as the alternative. While I'm making my books, the boards are temporarily held together with strips of masking, washi, or drafting tape. These tapes aren't supposed to damage the things they stick to, but Davy Board still struggles with them. Despite this, I think that Davy Board still snags the win in this category and will be my go-to for future projects. Okay, now we get to the topic that has inspired more questions and comments on this channel than anything else. And for good reason. There is so much mystique, misunderstanding, and controversy surrounding leather. I'm going to do my best to cut through some of that obscurity and give you my honest opinion, supported by what data I can find. The main question is whether you should use vegetable tanned or chrome tanned leather. But to understand that question, we need to go back in time. Again. For thousands of years, animal skins were tanned into leather by soaking them for months, along with layers of leaves and bark, a process we now call vegetable tanning. But everything changed in the mid-1800s, when a new process was invented to get a similar result much more efficiently by using the element chromium. And people have been debating about which method is better, literally, ever since. Many leather workers avoid using chrome-tanned leather because it can't be carved and shaped when wet like veg-tan can. But it can have designs pressed into it with heated tools, which is the primary method for traditional book decorating, so that's kind of a moot point here. Veg tan leather patinas with age, while chrome tan keeps its color. But which of those is better is purely a matter of taste. Despite being generally thinner and lighter than veg tan, chrome tanned leather has greater tensile strength and is less brittle. Experiments on shoe soles have found that chrome tan resists wear and tear better than veg tan, but on the other hand, it absorbs more water, including from the environment. Veg tan is usually available in uncolored hides, which gives you both the opportunity and the obligation to dye it the color that you want. Chrome tan leather is sold pre-dyed and finished in many attractive colors, but the only way you can change that color is with paint. There are other differences between the two, including a whole controversy on which method is more eco-friendly, but in terms of mechanical properties, there's not a clear winner here. People tend to look down on chrome tan leather as mass-produced or less artisanal, but empirically speaking, there's nothing wrong with using it for book rebinding. And some professional book conservators do use it. Okay, back to my projects. As you may have guessed, I used the more traditional veg tan leather for my 300 year book. But to get a skin that was thin enough and pre-dyed, I had to order from a bindery overseas. I picked a discount hide with some color imperfections to get a better price, but I still had to pay through the nose and wait several months for shipping. On the other hand, I ordered my chrome tanned leather from eBay, got three whole skins for all of 32 bucks, and they arrived within a week. Both types of leather performed great on my books. So yeah, in the absence of any clear reason why I should go through the pain of sticking to veg tan, I think it's chrome for me from here on out. Unbelievable! With the leather in place, all the two books need is some decoration. For the first book, I'm decorating with heat transfer vinyl. Vinyl allows my creativity to go wild, and I really leaned into its strengths for this cover art. These unique organic shapes would be very difficult to reproduce with traditional book finishing techniques. Heat transfer techniques like these have only been around since the 60s, so I'm not really sure how long this stuff is gonna last. But if my old high school t-shirts have survived for over a decade of use without much wear and tear, then a treasured volume sitting on a shelf should at least reach our 30 or so year goal. Although it is very easy to work with, the HTV for our 30 year book is actually much more expensive than its counterpart from the 300 year binding. 
hot stamping foil. I applied the foil using a method I developed last year, which approximates traditional gold tooling techniques where heated stamps press designs into the leather. This debossing also protects the gilding a little by pushing it back away from the surface of the book. This process is a lot more time and skill intensive than the heat transfer vinyl is, and I'm restricted to designs that I can make with the limited number of stamps in my collection, but the end result looks classic and timeless. Regardless of which method I use, I can make both last a little longer by applying a finishing touch of leather sealer, like this EcoFlow Super Sheen. Each decorating medium has such different strengths and weaknesses that I don't think I can actually choose between them. I'm going to keep practicing both techniques and use one or the other on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's it for these two creations, different from the inside out. We've judged each component by its merits, and now you can judge the outcomes by their looks. But if you're feeling especially judgmental, we can also go on and judge them by their price tags. Now obviously the two are very different sizes, but I'm going to correct for that by scaling up the supply usage of the smaller book to match the bigger one. And here's the final bill. I'm only counting supplies consumed in the binding process here, so no vinyl cutters, book presses, or leather stamps, and I'm only charging each book for the amount of each product that it consumed. If a bottle of glue could make four books, then there's only a quarter bottle price here. Clearly, the 300-year binding is a lot more expensive than its competitor. But notice that most of that disparity comes from the leather I used. You could mix and match products from both lists to get the cost-benefit ratio that you like most. I'm not here to tell you what to buy, but I hope that this conversation has given you some tools to help you make purchases on your own that you'll be happy with. This video was inspired by all the awesome comments I've received asking for more detail on the bookbinding supplies I choose. And the question that usually goes along with that is, how do I pick the right leather hide for bookbinding? If you've had the same question, click on this video right here, right now, and I'll see you again in like two seconds with the answers. Thanks for watching.